Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Subro Sessions. Today's episode is entitled Stop Suing Yourself, a brief discussion on the anti-subrogation rule. My name is Katherine Dempsey, and I'm an associate in the subrogation department. And joining me here today is Gus Sarah, a partner in our subrogation department. Hello, everybody. I am doing great. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for joining us, all million viewers of you. We are happy to have you here today, Gus. Today, we are going to discuss the anti-subrogation rule. So at its core, the anti-subrogation rule is a common law defense to subrogation. Basically states that a subrogated insurance company is essentially standing in the shoes of its insured and cannot bring a subrogation action against its own insured. If you think about it, this makes sense and is logical. The carrier is standing in the shoes of its insured. It's paid its insured an amount for um, the claim that the insured has filed and can't turn around and just recoup the money that it's paid its insured for a property damage or, or other type of loss. So although this seems like a fairly simple concept, it can be quite complex, and the purpose of today's episode is to explore the purpose, history behind the anti-subrogation rule, as well as how it applies in various states across the country. I'm excited. Are you excited? We're very excited. So the public policy and purpose behind the anti-subrogation rule is twofold. The first purpose is the insurer should not be able to pass its loss onto its own insured, avoiding the coverage for which the insured has paid for. The second purpose of the anti-subrogation rule is the insurance company should not be placed in a situation where there could be a potential conflict of interest. Essentially, each state differs in how they apply the anti-subrogation rule and what exceptions are involved. And essentially, it's really important to understand anti-subrogation rule and all the exceptions based on the state that you're dealing with because it allows us as subrogation professionals to ensure successful subrogation recoveries. So when you first get a case, the most important aspects to examine are who are the parties, what are the facts, and what does the policy say, as well as are there any additional agreements that could be involved. The most basic application of the anti-subrogation rule is the concept of the direct insured. So basically, if your insured is listed on the policy, the insurance carrier is not going to have any luck in recovering against their own insured, which is essentially the purpose of the anti-subrogation rule. So getting into the more complex aspects of the anti-subrogation rule is when the insured is listed as an additional insured. Yeah. So where we see the anti-subrogation rule show its troublesome face the most is in instances of the additional insured status. This typically arises from a contract between parties where one party is required to secure an insurance policy and name other parties as additional insureds on the policy. This is very typical in construction contracts, particularly where a builder's risk policy is required. We also see this in business contracts, and we see the additional insured or quote-unquote co-insured status arise in landlord-tenant situations as well. So the typical additional insured situation that we see is where the contract includes an additional insured provision, and the policy likewise has an endorsement naming the particular or specific third party as an additional insured. Another situation is where the policy includes a more generic provision that describes a category that the third party falls under, such as also insured are any contracts or subcontractors that you work with on the project or some type of generic general provision like that. In these situations where the additional insured is identified in the same policy from which the carrier paid the claim, Like Catherine said, uh, there is little wiggle room to argue around those situations. Absolutely. And then we get into murkier situations where there could be some wiggle room to argue that the third party tort fees is not an additional insured on the policy. One of those situations is when the contract states or implies that a party is to be an additional insured, but the actual insurance policy does not include such an additional insured provision. In those cases, I certainly make the argument that despite the contract language, the third party is not an additional insured because the insurance carrier was never made aware of such provision and it was not included in the policy. However, if this issue is litigated, it is likely that a court would enforce the additional insured status. 
an area where we see this often is in the landlord tenant setting. Right, Catherine? Absolutely. All the time. Now, we're not going to deep dive into the topic during this episode, but in many states, there is a doctrine called the implied co-insured, also known as the Sutton Doctrine, that states absent direct contrary language in the lease agreement, a residential tenant is deemed an additional insured under the landlord's policy for the building. In those jurisdictions, a residential tenant gets additional insured status on the landlord's policy, despite and regardless of whether the tenant is not actually named in the insurance policy. Arguably not fair to the insurance carrier, but the courts have decided over time that it is better to tip the scale of justice uh, in favor of the third party as opposed to the insurance carrier. Because of the vast law associated with the Sutton Doctrine or the Implied Co-Insured Doctrine, we will be doing an entire episode on that topic in the very near future. So get excited. (laughs) It's going to be amazing. (laughs) So another thing to consider, which may not always be apparent, is that there are situations where an insured has an affiliate company right? So John Smith Pizza also owns John Smith a Hair Salon, right? Mm-hmm. They have the same principles and they're technically affiliated companies because they share the same principles, but they're different legal entities, right? So if John Smith Pizza is the named insured in the policy, Technically, John Smith Salon is not an additional insured on the policy, even though John Smith owns both companies. It's all about the actual name of the entity named in the insurance policy. So this isn't directly an additional insured situation, but it's something kind of adjacent to the additional insured situation that we see all the time. And there may be business reasons uh, that a carrier would not want to pursue an affiliated company to the insured, but that's technically not a legal concern. It's more of a concern of do I want to sue another company that my our insured, you know, our insured's principal also owns or is affiliated with, and that's something that we run into a lot. And you can go down a rabbit hole as to all those kinds of examples, such as a relative who comes by to uh, fix your sink and there's a water loss. Do you want to go after them, even though they're a relative, but technically not uh, does not qualify as an additional insured on the policy. Again, those are more of kind of business strategic decisions that we often you know, leave to the carrier to decide as to how you want us to proceed. Absolutely. And I know Gus and I have both dealt with numerous cases with similar circumstances. Yeah. And there's a difference between legal barriers and things that just make you uncomfortable. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Certainly suing, you know, an insured brother-in-law is is not an ideal situation to be. But, you know, we, as our duty as subrogation attorneys is simply to advise the client as to how they want us to handle the situation and what the legal parameters are. Absolutely. So moving on, there's also the situation where an insurance carrier is the target on a separate policy. So you have the policy that you've paid the claim on, and then you, the tortfeasor, the third-party tortfeasor, is an insured by the same carrier on a different policy. In some jurisdictions, courts have established that a carrier cannot subrogate against an insured on a separate policy as well. An example of this, in California, a carrier cannot subrogate against an insured on a separate policy, just the same as if the insured was on the same policy. The seminal case in California on this issue is National Union Fire Insurance Company of Pittsburgh, PA, versus Engineering Science, Inc. This is a 1987 federal court case from a district court for the Northern District of California. This case involved damage to an ocean sewer pipeline also known as an outfall. I'm sure you knew that, Catherine. Absolutely. (laughs) This pipeline was commissioned by the Monterey Regional Water Pollution Control Agency. The agency hired a general contractor to install the line and an engineer to design the line. National Union Fire Insurance insured both entities. After the damage was discovered, National Union paid out $4.5 
over four million on behalf of the general contractor. National Union then sued the engineer, alleging faulty design. Mm-hmm. The company said, hold the phone, friend. You insure us too. And National Union said, so that's a different policy. That's totally not relevant. And the court agreed with the defendant that the same public policy reasons and concerns for not allowing subrogation against the insureds on the same policy existed for insureds on separate policies as well. So that was a no-go for the uh, engineering company. This is also the law in Pennsylvania. That being said, this is not always the case, and a subrogating carrier should consider the jurisdiction when deciding how to approach this particular issue. While the National Union case tells us that in California, a carrier cannot subrogate against an insured on a different policy, some jurisdictions have no case law on the matter. So if there's an opportunity in a state that hasn't decided the issue, then it might be worth making the argument that the anti-subrogation rule doesn't apply. With respect to additional exceptions, another factor to consider is the language of the policy may not apply to the third party in question. In Factory Mutual Insurance Company versus Skanska, a United States building, which is a 2020 U.S. district case out of the District of Massachusetts, the court considered whether contractors on a construction job qualified as additional insurance on the developer's builder's risk insurance policy. The property damage section of the policy stated that the policy insured the interest of the contractor and subcontractors in the insured's property to the extent of the insured's legal liability for the insured physical loss or damage to such property. So after a water loss, the builder's risk carrier paid the developer for the damage and filed a subrogation action against the general contractor and one subcontractor. The defendants filed a motion for summary judgment claiming that there were additional insureds on the policy. The court found that the way the provision was written, it only applied to the extent of the named insured's legal liability. Since the defendants were separate entities and not affiliated with the named insured, there was no legal liability on the named insured's part. And thus, the defendants did not qualify as additional insureds. This was a very technical and, and closely analyzed ca- case where the court really meticulously interpreted a narrow construction of the additional insured provision. This case shows us that no additional insured provision has absolute reach and that a court could interpret a provision scope to be quite narrow, which could be a good thing for us. So it's very important to look at the additional insured provision consider the third party in question and whether that person truly falls under that category of additional insured. Another interesting case regarding the interpretation of additional insured provision is Gilbane Building Co. slash TDX Construction Corp. versus St. Paul Fire and Marine Insurance Company, which is a 2018 Court of Appeals of New York decision. Here, a New York agency contracted with a general contractor to build a new forensic laboratory for New York City. The agency entered into a separate contract to retain a construction manager, a totally separate entity. The contract between the agency and the general contractor required the GC to secure a builder's risk liability policy and to include the construction manager as an additional insurer. Keep in mind that the general contractor and the construction contractor were separate entities and did not have a contract with each other. The relevant provision in the policy was titled additional insured hyphen by written contract and read who is an insured section two is amended to include as an insured any person or organization with whom you've agreed to add as an additional insured by written contract, but only with respect to liability arising out of your operations or premises owned uh, or rented by you. After some defects in the foundation of the building were discovered, the agency sued the construction company and the target. The target then filed a third-party action against the construction manager, 
and the construction manager filed a, a claim with the liability builder's risk insurance carrier. The carrier denied coverage because the general contractor, the named insured, did not have an actual written contract with the construction manager. The Court of Appeals agreed, finding that based on the language of the policy provision, the construction manager did not qualify as an additional insured because it had no written contract with the named insured. So the language of the policy provision is actually really important in determining whether or not a particular party falls under the scope of the additional insured status. The indemnity language in the contract must be considered together with the policy language because sometimes those policies are those provisions, the provision in the contract and the provision in the policy do not match. And there might be a discrepancy that you can use to argue that perhaps one of the parties doesn't fall under the additional insured status. Definitely. Another exception to consider is the no coverage exception. Under this exception, if an insurer pays one insured for damage caused by another insured, but the policy does not cover the second insured for the loss or act at at issue, the insurer might be allowed to subrogate against the second insured. This exception has been recognized by courts in Illinois and New York, as well as other jurisdictions, though it does appear to be rarely invoked. Uh, A quick example of how this would come into play is if husband and wife get into a fight, both of them are named insureds on a policy, husband intentionally destroys a portion of the property because he was so mad and there was you know a domestic fight. Mm-hmm. Technically, intentional acts are not covered under the policy. Exactly. In certain jurisdictions, the carrier may be able to subrogate against the husband for the damage caused to the house. Okay. Not a very practical example because who wants to sue an uninsured angry husband? <laughs> but there are some situations where something like that would fall into play and the the third party is not actually covered for that particular act or that loss. Mm-hmm. Again, a very murky situation. And I think there's a lot of states that have not even decided this issue, but something to consider when you're in that situation. Another exception is subcontractors negligence. And that has to be fully understood when evaluating whether or not a contractor qualifies as an additional insured. If a contract requires that a general contractor be named as an additional insured, it does not necessarily extend to subcontractors retained on the project. Without clear language, including the subcontractors as additional insureds, the subcontractors could be fair game. So that's something that you want to look out for as well. Okay, so that's our little brief introduction to the anti-subrogation rule. We hope you found it informative. And Catherine and I are here if you want to reach out to us individually for any additional questions. We'd be happy to discuss this further with you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Subro Sessions. Be sure to listen to the next episode of Subro Sessions, which will be released the third Tuesday of next month, March 19th in this case. You can find past episodes of the podcast and relevant case updates on the Subrogation Strategist blog, all available at whiteandwilliams.com. We would like to remind everyone that the contents of this podcast should not be construed as legal advice or to give a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation with any specific legal question you may have.